It's time for Pure Performance. Get your stopwatches ready. It's time for Pure Performance with Andy Grabner and Brian Wilson. Hello and welcome to another episode of Pure Performance. My name is Brian Wilson, and as always, I have with me my co-host, Mr. Andy Grabner. Andy, how are you doing today? I'm pretty good, and I am, uh, so no weird dreams today? No, you're my Apple Watch is telling me I'm not. Uh, oh, should I endorse Apple? Sure. My Apple <laughs> Watch isn't, uh, I expect a free one now for my next one. It's telling me I'm not getting much REM sleep or even deep sleep, but uh, you know, I'm still... I don't know how well. It actually, in order to get a free one, it measures it perfectly and it's wonderful. Uh, and I can't highly recommend it enough. Um, that's just my plug for a free watch. Mm-hmm. This turned out to be the stupidest intro ever because yeah. I had no uh, dreams. It's, 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 it's because of me. Sorry. Uh, look, our guest oh. is jumping in beforehand. He it's thinks, he thinks we because we he's. Brief uh, him. We didn't brief him well enough. He thinks, well, this this fits in with, with the sector that he works in, like always intruding, always like getting in the way and thinking they can dominate everything. So I think it's very fitting that he did that. Yeah. You know, it might as well. We just let him introduce himself because we already started talking anyway, and we can uh, forget about all the other jokes we have prepared in the opening. So yeah. welcome am... to the show, Willie Hicks. <laughs> <laughs> I have ruined everything. I everything. Am... All right. No. I, well, it's a pleasure to be here. I know I, I've stepped over all your jokes. I've stepped over everything, but it the is The audience a thanks you. The audience yeah. thanks you. I, well, and, uh, and I thank <laughs> you for inviting me. So I'm Willie Hicks. Uh, I run our uh, solutions engineering here at Donatrace. And uh, I've known you guys for a minute or two. So it's good to be be here with you. And, and really, it's, uh, we just uh, said earlier, right? We haven't seen each other in years. Um, mm. um, and obviously, with uh, a pandemic uh, in between, everything feels really odd these days. And it was like, how long? Six years or something like that. Um, but it's, it's amazing that, um, you are, you've been working with, uh, a particular type of clientele or clientele mm. that we typically, well, we sometimes interact, but not as much as you two. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that is because you're working with the federal government in the U.S. a lot. And I actually the reason why we got to this podcast is because I listened to another podcast that showed up in one of my I don't know streams, and it's called Tech Transforms. Yep. And it's a podcast that you and uh, Carolyn Ford are hosting, as far as I understand, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and and I want to be, you know. I want to give all my props to Carolyn Ford. This was her brainchild, Tech Transforms. A um, couple of years now, um, we've been doing this. And um, usually it's myself um, and Carolyn or Mark Sunil, um, who's the uh, the VP over public sector who do Tech Transforms. And um, it's just a, a phenomenal, I mean, a super phenomenal podcast. But, you know, I, I would say... Uh, I think you guys have been here a little bit longer than we have, but, um, and I, honestly, I've been listening to some of your podcasts for a while too, but, um, we come from a, a maybe a little bit different slant. Uh, like you said, we're, we're focused on the public sector. We're focused on the, the kind of the federal side of the house and the sled, the state and local side of the house, but, um, a mm-hmm. lot of great episodes out there. Um, Everything from generals um, to we've had uh, directors from even the Intel space. We've had so intelligence. Um, I won't mention any names here, but you can go and find it on um, find it online. Um, we get people from industry. Um, Who's that so, behind you? Who's that behind you? <laughs> I'm not supposed to say. <laughs> no, uh, I, I would like to keep my job. No, but no, seriously, a um, lot of great episodes out there, um, even, you know, from different agencies like Department of Energy. We had Ann Duncan, who was a phenomenal. I so enjoyed that uh, conversation with Ann Duncan, uh, who's the CIO over at Department of Energy. Um, really interesting. It was one of those um, podcasts that when it was over, I, it, it had gone so quick. It was like it felt like it had been like five minutes. Um, mm-hmm. But it was already been of thirty forty five minutes, so mm-hmm. a lot of good stuff out there. Mm-hmm. And you know, for me, the interesting thing is, so we I just came back from 
uh, a tour to uh, South Africa where I recorded two podcasts. And I think in our role that we have here as podcasters, it's great to bring these stories to our listeners, right? Because I mean, most of, I assume most of the listeners, you know, we're spread around the globe, but still I would assume most of you come from the EMEAs, the United States. Um, and so listening to them and hearing stories from other parts of the world is really interesting. Hearing that we're all struggling with the same challenges. Uh, it feels every time when I talk with somebody from outside my geographical area, they always say, well, we, we are far behind of what you are because we're dealing with all these problems. And then I say, you know what? No, you're not. You're not far behind. We're all dealing with the same problems. We all have the same challenges. Uh, and it's great that we can talk about it. Now, mm-hmm. same goes true for you, right? I mean, I assume uh, that you, you probably have, you see similar challenges that we do, but I don't know, which is why, you know, we invited you to learn a little bit about what's going on. What are the topics that you're discussing in the public space um, around what we are typically discussing uh, performance engineering, observability, security is a big topic. Just looking at your uh, last episodes, insider threats, critical infrastructure, and evolving AI. Um, there's a couple of uh, cybersecurity uh, episodes up there. Mm-hmm. So, Willie, just to toss it over to you, what are some of the topics that are currently hot in, in the space that you operate in most? What are the conversations you have on the podcast, but also outside of the podcast? What can we learn from you? Oh, well... So, so um, first of all, let me kind of comment on what you just said and, and really double click on that because the problems that we see in the public sector space, so that's federal, the state and local, um, you know, they're very similar to what we see in commercial. They're going to be very similar to what we see globally. So we, you know, I, I have the, the privilege and honor to work with colleagues kind of around the globe in the, the federal space and public sector space. And what, what I hear from them is very similar across the board. Um, our, our, our agency partners are interested in observability, obviously. They're interested in things like DevOps and DevSecOps. They're interested, very interested in things like today, customer experience, user experience, which we, we talk a lot about here at Dynatrace is a very big topic in the um, public sector and the federal space, especially because at least this administration, um, the Biden administration has made a, a priority, a focus on customer experience. They put out some executive orders on it. Um, because you know, our the 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 constituents in this customer um, in this country, the the taxpayers, um, they are citizens who are using you know they use you know Amazon daily, they use um, uh, e-commerce apps, they go to the mm-hmm. bank and you know they don't go into branches as much anymore. They go online and they do all their transactions and so forth. And so those expectations exist for federal services as well. And so understanding that the administration has kind of doubled down on um, wanting to make sure that there is good customer experience across the board. So these are very similar um, wants, needs, desires. Now, what I would say is where we see a divergence, where there's a difference is motivation. Um, Now, what I mean by that is that you know, in the commercial space, um, and I, I, I've been here close to 13 years now. I think Brian and I, we were, we, we cut our teeth about the same time here yep. starting at Donna Trace and, um, the, Working a little bit on the commercial side, and I come from commercial as well. I, I worked in the banking sector for uh, many, many years before I came to Donna Trace. And, you know, on the commercial side of the house, you're, you're really, um, interested in things like ROI. What's my return? on the investment I'm about to make. They, they're, you're, you're really concerned about competition and making sure that we, you know, we are competitive in, in whatever space we're in. You're worried about, you know, your, um, um, your stockholders and, and making sure that you've got good revenue streams, all those things. The government, not as much. The government really is not concerned about when they're looking at a product uh, like an observability platform. They're not concerned about ROI. They're not concerned about, you know, um, ensuring that, you know, um, that they are competitive um, from a financial standpoint as much. There are some agencies, to be clear, there are some agencies that are actual, uh, actually um, revenue centers. Like if you go and get a visa, you pay for that mm-hmm. visa. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, you know, parts of the State Department, um, like TSA, those DHS, um, the, those are actual revenue centers. They actually 
their budgets actually come from, you know, the, the revenue they generate from their, their products and services. The, the rest of the government, they have budgets. They have to try to be good stewards of that money, good stewards of the, the taxpaying dollar. Um, but they're not really driven by the same thing. Um, competition, competition's even a little bit different. Um, you're, you're not competitive with like, it's not like Apple versus, you know, I probably shouldn't endorse, like you said, <laughs> or, but it's not a product versus another product. Um, a lot of times is one country against another country. You I was going to say um, that too, but I was going to, I was going to say one country versus another, but like jokingly, country. but yeah, you yeah, said it, it is yeah, competition. Yeah. You know, we, we have to be, you know, we, we have to be competitive with our adversaries. We have to make sure that we can remain technologically um, advanced enough. So we, we aren't, you know, when we see a lot of this now in the cyberspace, like a lot of the cyber attacks, ransomware attacks, those are coming from, although they might be, sometimes lone actors, a lot of times they're state sponsored, like there are states and, and countries that are sponsoring these people to attack our critical infrastructure, banking environments and so forth. So that was a lot there, but that's just kind mm -hmm. of a sense uh, if that helps. Yeah. And one other thing too, that I've heard in terms of some differences and I'm, I'm not, not going to go deep into a rabbit hole on this at all, but like you, you mentioned it. So I've, I've talked to somebody who's had some government contract work. And I mm -hmm. think when you mentioned you know, this administration is is um, interested in uh, user experience, right? Mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges that I've heard in the public sector is specifically that changeover of who's in charge. Not necessarily always, you know, the president, but whoever's in charge of a department or whatever, as that changes, suddenly everything can shift, right? If yeah. that person wants to make their own mark and take it in a different direction, everything you've been working on at that time gets tossed out right. and you take a new direction until that right. person gets replaced. And then, so it just seems like from a challenge for the employees in the public sector is sure. the, the, it, you know, I imagine that all the employees have very similar feelings that any, uh, well, not just feelings, but tech, technical, technological feelings that anybody in any sector feels, right? Like I want to do really cool things. I want to do really advanced, uh, components. Right. But there are a lot more at the whim of who's in charge at that time for wherever they're at. Um, like, it's not like they're hard, the hopes and desires from a technological point of view are probably the same as every other developer and, and right. ops person. Um, yeah. But is, so, that, is that, yeah. So you're, yeah, and I'm just kind of I'm, I'm smiling here because um, it's politics. A lot of this yeah. is straight up politics. And, um, but I, I've actually learned over the years, it, and it's really interesting to watch that, uh, yes, administrations change. And with those new administrations, new leadership comes in, they'll do a lot of swapping out of, you know, you know, be it a Democratic led um, administration or a Republican led red, um, administration. You know, they're all going to have their own agendas. They're all going to have their own. And, and sometimes that can cause disruption. But one thing that I I've actually seen is that when you get down to the, the people who are actually, you know, day to day protecting our country, the ones who are day to day, you know, who have been public servants for years for decades mm -hmm. um they've learned th th there's the converse of that too yeah administrations can change priorities can change but also they can wait it out so a lot of times mm -hmm. you know they will um they know that in four years this administration might change but they're going to be here another 10 or 20 years so mm -hmm. they, they they will continue on um with um and, and sometimes that's where it becomes a little frustrating too because so like there might be a new policy that comes out, like the, this whole new focus on customer experience. The next administration might not have the same focus, and you might have a an agency that they're like, yeah, this a customer experience thing is important, but my mission dictates that I, I really need to focus on this. So, yes, I'm going to try to do the bare minimum to make sure I can comply with, you know, whatever the OMB might come out with or whatever reg regulations might be there. But I'm going to focus on my mission I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to really like, you know, like I'm not going to come in and Dynatrace is going to talk to me about, you know, user experience. That, that's not really my mission focus right now. So so from my standpoint, I have to do a lot of listening. I have to listen to what the agencies need. I have to understand their mission because, you know, the, the customer experience portion of it might not be their focus right now. Right. And, and, and those things will switch with administration. So um, it, it is it is interesting, though, to see how how politics plays into this whole thing. Yeah.
So uh, one, one, one thought that I had on this though, because Brian, you mentioned, right, this, you know, the change of the guard. So like the new administration comes in and everything changes completely. I mean, this can also happen, you know, in the public, uh, in the private sector, you know, think mm -hmm. about when Twitter was taken over and both, <laughs> right? I mean, obviously that was a big change <laughs> or every time you have a, you know, CEOs get replaced for different reasons and then they have a different mission, as you said. So it, it can also happen in uh, in the private space and not on a four years schedule but even more frequent if 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 the you know is i mean it's obviously possible um really for me what's what's interesting so you say are people then moving a lot like employees people that actually you know as you said keep the country safe keep the machines running uh, implement new new technology do you see uh, a lot of uh, fluctuation in um in people moving then either between departments or also moving to the private sector? Is this something that, that you see a lot? Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, I will say I, I don't, well, I, I don't see it directly, but I talk to a lot of my, my customers and a lot of agencies that, you know, we talk about workforce a lot and talk about how, um, they maintain a strong workforce. Um, a lot of the, the government workforce is contractor based. Um, so there are a lot of contractors in the, the federal government. So, um, you know, that's how kind of they maintain some of that workforce. But this is this is a big problem, just like in the private sector. Um, mm. I'll use cybersecurity as, as an mm. example. So cyber getting I, I think I was reading a report um, a, a, a month or two ago that said, um, you know, that there's a shortage of about 700,000 um, mm. trained in, employees that they need to fill cybersecurity roles. And that's that's not just the government. That, I mean, there there are and this is a problem public sector um as well as private sector and so there is this this pull uh, uh from you know you know private sector sometimes pays more money mm -hmm. uh, what i've heard from the public sector is that the public sector doesn't pay as much but they have some really great benefits they have excellent super excellent benefits and when i was talking to one agency i won't mention the person's name but uh, cuz he he told me this off to the side but he was he was you know he was a little frustrated because he knew all the great benefits that come from the government, but his agency was just so bad at promoting those. It was like, if you promote this, you actually might get people who want to come mm. over um, because you might not get paid as much. But, you know, when it comes to health care, when it comes to your pensions, when it comes to your your long term stability and so forth. Um, you, you, you really can't get a better job than a, um, a, a government job sometimes. And then, um, also you do have, um, in the past, you had, um, public sector employees who were long, long, lifelong. They would be 20, 30, 40 year, you know, veterans of the public sector. Uh, today, you do have a lot more fluctuation, especially in the IT and the technology space. People just kind of move in and out. And so keeping, you know, um, Keeping someone in a job in a seat for a while is a problem. Now, there are some agencies I've talked to, they're embracing this, though. They're trying to actually do more public-private partnership where they're embracing people. Okay, go out, go into the public sector, I mean, to the private sector. You know, there's always an opening for you to come back. You know, they, they're almost encouraging people to, you know, if you go out, get that experience. If you find out it's not working for you, come back you know, come back to the public sector, come back to our agency, because they actually get a benefit because this person goes out into the private sector, gets a whole lot different experience, um, actually gets, you know, experience in more different varying technologies, then they can bring that knowledge back into, you know, their agency. So I think agencies are starting to think about that. They're also actually starting to change their pay scale. So they're actually trying to be more competitive as well. Um, but, you know, we do, to answer the question, though, there is, um, you know, there, I, from what I have talked to agencies and all kind of, um, you know, Th this this workforce issue is something we're seeing across all agencies and keeping people in place. Um, there are some agencies like I know I was like I mentioned earlier, I was talking to Ann Duncan at Department of Energy. They do a great job at internships. They've got a really robust um, program where they're bringing people in very young, getting them experience in the federal government, trying to kind of promote like they used to in the past. Like they're working for the government in the past used to be like a, a badge of honor. You know, it, the the whole idea, mm -hmm. like you know, they used to call it um, good enough for government work. That was th that seems like a derogatory, you know, term now in the past. It actually was a um, it was actually it didn't mean what it meant today. I mean, the, the, I think yeah. that 
there, there needs to be more better marketing of government jobs. But um, and I, I think they're trying to work towards that. It feels a little bit like as you bring this up, I remember, you know, working in a bank used to be a, a big thing, uh, at least when I grew up, oh, you work in the bank, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And I think then, you know, uh, it kind of lost a little bit of its, uh, of, of its appeal, but I think it came back, especially with, with, with modern banks and the fintech space. So with, I remember Capital One was the, one of the stories that, uh, really yeah. made it, uh, in, in the DevOps space, right? And at, at pretty much every DevOps conference, you heard the Capital One success story or how they were breaking out of the kind of rigid, uh, environment of the classical banks. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that attracted a lot of new talent back to the banks and they wanted to work for the bank and revolutionize it. Right? And so it feels like, um, you know, this may be bouncing. I mean, this is stuff that may also come back with every industry and right? including the government sector. Yeah. I agree that pendulum swings back and forth. And, you know, I, I think the government, I think it's starting to swing back to become more, uh, you know, I'm hearing more and more agencies is becoming more in vogue. And, and you, you mentioned, you know, we were talking about earlier some of the topics like you don't hear some of the like, um, like in the, com in the commercial space and the, private sector, you've got like so SREs, like there's the the whole idea of site reliability engineers and so forth. Um, I'm even starting to see not in every agency, but I'm starting to see in agencies like at the Federal Reserve and places like, well, Federal Reserve is kind of quasi government, but you look at um, uh, GSA, um, General Services Administration, and um, I think even places like US Digital Services, where they're really more focused on kind of newer technologies like web-based, um, um, containerized, um, cloud-based applications and so forth. This idea of site reliability engineer is, is actually starting to, to get traction even in the government. So they're, they're, it's starting to, um, I think, become more and more like the private sector. We're still, they're still behind, but I think we're starting to make some strides there. But I'm sorry, you were saying, Brian. Oh, no, I was going to say to Andy's point, too, is, you know, m my story here is more on state government level, but it's still like this government idea. Um, you know, when people think about the government institutions and all the the newer, more more derogatory view of it is, you know, oh, I'm good enough for government. Right. But then mm -hmm. if you go on pr probably most any state, but I'm here in Colorado, you go on their DMV site. Right, you go on their government site. Everything's available online. You can do almost all of your transactions online, quick, easy. Right, searching for something online has become very easy. So it's not, you know, in some cases, my online experience with some of the government, you know, the, the state government agencies that I have to get involved with, can be easier and quicker than some stores which just have lousy websites. So the idea that everything in government is antiquated, slow, bulky, it's going to be some green screen and you're typing text into it, you know, totally not the case. And probably, again, I'd say probably, I don't know about if it's every state, but most states, probably if you go on the DMV site, uh, you know, you can do almost everything. You know, if you got to get a picture taken or inspection, obviously you're going to have to go down. Um, but you can do almost everything on that site smooth and easy. So that that perception is definitely shifting. Uh, you see it when you interact with these things. I don't do much interaction with you know federal agencies online, fortunately. Um, <laughs> but it's you know so I don't have that experience. But yeah, there's a shift going there. There's some cool stuff. So a lot of those you know a lot of those those people behind the scenes are getting to implement really cool stuff, really getting to show off their chops of, of what they can do. They're just not getting the glory of the Capital One stories per se, or the Amazon stories because mm -hmm. it's 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 just there. But what the the last thing I'll say on that, what I really appreciate is, I think for the younger generations who didn't experience the old stuff, they just go on and it's sorry, it's a website, whatever, I get to do what I want. But for us older folks who knew the way we had to do it in the past, you know, even before it was online and had to go wait three hours at DMV, but then maybe when it started online, we can really see that shift and change and appreciate it a lot. So. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to throw kudos out to there for at least on the state level. That's in my own experience with it. But obviously that's transforming into, I'm sure, every level of, of federal, um, you know, IT. Yeah, I, I would uh, say, Brian, your your observation is is, is accurate. I think it, it is it 
it, it does kind of vary from state to state. Like you, you've got, obviously you've got your big, you've got your California's, your Texas, your, your Colorado or, or New York, Florida, really big states, um, big budgets, you know, they, they got a lot of population. So, so I think, you know, a lot of times you'll see, you know, a lot more online services, more, mm-hmm. you know, more that experience there. You get into smaller states, you know, get into places like, you know, I'm not going to call out small states and all, but you get, <laughs> you know, you get into places like in the central Midwest, places like that, even some places in the South where you got, you know, smaller populations, smaller budgets. Um, you, you're not going to, you're seeing maybe the uptick a little bit slower. Um, I see it at the federal level too, but it's also the same thing at the federal level. You got agencies like the big, um, so, so in the federal government, you have, um, agencies, there's something called uh, a HISP in in um, the federal government. That's the high impact service provider. Mm-hmm. So in the federal government, um, this is kind of going back to those initiatives around better customer experience. The The administration identified um, a, a list or there are, this, this, there are these groups of agencies and services that are considered like super high impact super customer facing, you know, you think about USDA, like the the WIC program or SNAP or like some of the big, you know, uh, food assistance programs. You think about IRS, um, the, obviously that's a, a huge, uh, a, a huge um, forward facing program, um, social security administration. So these high impact service providers, they're kind of, uh, they are kind of at the, the focus of the administration, making sure that they are working on their, um, improving their customer experience. They're like dashboards set up with, um, office of management and budget. They have to report like stats on, you know, how they're improving their services and so forth. So, you know, that, but then there are other agencies that don't really fall in that category. They're smaller agencies. So, um, you know, a lot of times you'll get executive orders, you'll get these administrative mandates, but there's no money behind them. There's no budget. There's no, you know, money dedicated. So they're often trying to figure out how, okay, th- there's this mandate or there's this, you know, requirement that I improve X, but I have no money to do it. So, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those things where you'll, it kind of varies from agency to agency. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really, if you think about obviously, um, you know, the topic that impacts us all at least every day because that's who we work for or what we're working for, like observability. Mm-hmm. Uh, from an observability perspective, are there any, let's say, things that you see in the private sector that just work differently on how they implement observability, especially when you compare it with what you see? Uh, in, in the private sector, or do you still say, no, it's in the end, it's, it's all the same, even though there might be some regulations or is there something, are there specific requirements for observability vendors, for instance, right? I mean, that would be interesting. And, and therefore certain things don't work the same way. Is there anything like that mm. out there? So, so I think that, um, so when I think about observability, um, front, kind of front in the public sector, um, the first thing I think of is that um, agencies and kind of going back to their their needs, what what their mission really requires. I think that observability is seen a little bit differently. And we often, um, you know, approach observability and how we talk to our customers about it a little bit um, differently, because a lot of times when when we talk about observability in the commercial space, a lot of times we're talking about it from a cloud perspective, like, you know, um, migration to the cloud. How are you going to, you know, um, um, better utilize and and make utilization um, better um, um, show better utilization and and um, uh, get more value out of your cloud investment. Those are the kind of things that we're talking about. Like a lot of times in the the federal space, um, especially on the DOD side, they're really just starting to get into the cloud. There's not a lot of cloud deployments. A lot of things are still legacy. A lot of things are still on premise. Mm-hmm. Um, the 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 civilian side of the house that is a little bit more cloud there's a lot more cloud activity going on there so i think that it kind of changes the conversation a little bit also when i'm talking to customers about observability um and i'll say i don't think we do this as much on the um on the commercial side, you guys can tell me if I'm wrong here, but I, I tend to lean in and my SEs tend to lean in a little bit more often on security. 
Um, we don't lead with security because we have our, uh, you know, we have like AppSec, our application security. We have a lot of visibility that comes from, you know, just the nature of our agents being in place and all. But in the in the federal space today, one very hot topic when and it's not just a passing fad. This is something that's going to be a hot topic for a while is zero trust. So zero trust, um, this idea of a zero trust architecture or framework, um, it's not new. It's not something that's just like, you know, you know, just in, in vogue today and just, you know, um, appeared after the last, you know, major attack or the mad, last major ransomware incident. Um, zero trust and the concepts have been around for years, but because of some major high profile, um, breaches and incidents, um, agencies are really trying to figure out how they implement zero trust type architectures. And one thing that is important for our agencies to know and for our, our um, partners to know, and I would think this is important on the commercial side as well, is that observability, at least in my humble opinion, is foundational to zero trust. Um, because zero trust First is predicated on the idea that you know what's on your network. You know what is talking to what. You know the data flows. You basically have uh, almost a data flow inventory. And that's actually one of the things that you, you would have in a zero trust. And data flow inventory is this idea of I know how all the data, um, how all my data is flowing. If I need to implement network segmentation, I know where the best place to, to kind of break up the data. I know, um, the kind of the characteristics of the systems and the data. And when something is wrong, I'm reporting on it. Um, um, there is actually even, when we talk about uh, um, uh, security, uh, CISA, which is um, part of DHS, uh, they they actually um, released about a year ago what's called a binding operational directive around um, third party vulnerabilities. Literally, a, there is a you know a mandate out there that you need to understand all the third party software you have on there, what's vulnerable, you have like so long to patch it. Th these are things that are top of mind, and so these are things that uh, you know again I think make observability foundational and critical to building that um, that zero trust architecture. And so I talk about that a lot with my customers, uh, customers about, you know, how are you gathering this information today? How do you understand your data flows? How do you understand how your customers are interacting with your application in, and what agencies data is coming in and out of? And a lot of times they don't know that today, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it makes a lot of yeah. sense. And, and obviously, you know, we... There's different ways on on getting this level of observability, I guess, into into environments. You can, uh, I guess, from a network perspective, there's the classical uh, network infrastructure monitoring via SNMP. But then we also see with our agent, we know exactly who is talking to whom. So I, I, ne I never thought about using like the data that we have in Smartscape for exactly figuring out. Well, see, of course, who is talking to whom, but then also using it to day for data segmentation. Mm -hmm. I never thought about that. That's actually really, really interesting. Yeah, and you should yeah, get it, alerts, right? You should be able to to get alerts on, on, hey, this part of my data center must never talk to this part. Yes, and then you should even, like, I guess, with metadata enforce that say zone A, zone B, zone C, and nobody should cross from zone A right. into C directly. Something right. like it's like a. And now envisioning, uh, I don't know why this comes to my head, but it's. Um, a, a uh, Munich, the city of Munich, they have uh, the, the metro map, and I think it's like you have in the middle, you have your zone, and then you have the next zone and the next zone, mm -hmm. and depending mm -hmm. on how far you want to travel, you obviously then need to buy the ticket. I'm sure this is true for other cities as well, yeah. but it's kind of like if you want to go from zone one to three, you need to buy a ticket. You cannot just bypass one zone, and so this can be also applied to observability by saying, hey, you know, something is wrong here. Somebody should not go from A to C. They have to go via B at least. And yeah. this is so I, I I like that analogy, and this kind of just triggered a, a memory. Um, so uh, about a month a uh, month ago, about a year year and a half ago, I was talking to um, a, another agency. This was on the defense side of the house, and um, they were um, so so in in. And, and you, I, you hear about this probably more on the federal side um, than you do on commercial, but there there are these things called software factories. And especially in the DOD, they have like 
multiple, like all the different service branches have their different software factories. They're trying to get more into agile kind of mind state and um, mindset. And, and they built out these, um, these, these software factories to be more agile, to, to be able to respond more quickly to threats and so forth. And uh, there was a, a software factory we were working with and when they saw the SmartScape and they saw kind of this mapping and we showed them like there was it, it was just it, it was actually just a very small part of a, a review of a POC. And they saw some APIs that were going back and forth um, and they saw some conversations. And it was an API and they were like, whoa, that API should not be talking to this enclave. Mm -hmm. And they were like, first of all, they went to the developers like this API, you, you're not supposed to leave. And, and how they had it set up, they weren't blocking that right now. Um, so they didn't want that to get into production where this was actually communicating the wrong way. And they were like, can you give me an alert if this AP, like if I see, just like you were saying, conversation going mm -hmm. from one from here to here, because that means that someone has, you know, ha has, you know, is incorrectly using this API. They should not be calling mm -hmm. out to to mm -hmm. um, an outside system. And it was something really simple, real simple conversation. They were like, "That's huge," because mm -hmm. that, that you know that kind of goes back to our our the, uh, again. Th they were getting very more focused on um, baking in security earlier in the development process. And they were like, if we can catch these problems before they actually go into production, we're actually protecting the system, but also we're saving ourselves a lot of headaches and a lot of work because first of all, it shouldn't work once it gets out mm -hmm. there, but just God forbid something is misconfigured and it does work, you know, that data doesn't need to leak out. The, if mm -hmm. that, you know, that, that's, yeah. exact, I mean, that's exact uh, kind of use case we're looking at. Yeah. And, and I think that should be easily doable <clears throat> with the data and with mm -hmm. our automation capabilities now. And yeah, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. I need to write a note to some of our PMs or whoever is <laughs> listening in. If you're listening in and you're also an observability vendor, then maybe this is a an interesting idea to follow. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was explaining the story and I was, for whatever reason, coming back to when did we see each other last, Willie? And I think it was actually in 2016. It's no, uh, even further. Yeah, it was the mm. Beyond 2016 well, conference. Well, well, the lockdown years don't count. So, like, if it's That's if it's like six years, you think about it as four. <laughs> no, but I mean, just like it's like a block. Right. It's like it's almost like traveling from Zone A to C because you bypass yeah. that whole chunk in your head. Yeah, and, and the reason why, right yeah, the reason why it came up again is, um, I was actually I'm actually wondering. With, I, I learn a lot at conferences, so at least I, uh, I get to meet a lot of new people. I hear their stories. And these conferences that I go to, like KubeCon is coming up. And I guess by the time that this airs, KubeCon is either just going on or, or has just finished. But I, I wonder, do you have in the government sector your own conferences that are government internal that we never hear about because most government agencies don't share anything publicly? Is something that's something that exists? Um, so, so there are those types of conferences. There are, you know, there are conferences that, you know, you literally have to have like security clearances to get into certain, um, um, uh, sessions and so forth. But, uh, there are some that are big in the government space, but just aren't big everywhere else. For example, um, I have, um, actually spoken and moderated for a couple of years now at a cybersecurity, um, summit called Billington. That's in DC. Um, super, super well respected and um, um, big um, cybersecurity conference in the DC area. So a lot of federal customers um, and agencies go there, um, state and local, even I think some commercial. Um, again, it is it does have a cyber focus, but every time we we um, are there, um, I, I'm amazed at the number of um, agencies that I'm talking to that are like, yeah, you know, we, we need to talk more because mm -hmm. um, we don't know what's going on on our network. We, you know, getting these data flows, understanding these data flows, um, that's a big problem for us. Understanding, you know, just just really simple questions around, you know, like I was saying, like, like just that simple API use case is a big deal for, mm -hmm. for 
for our customers. Um, so that's one. Um, then there's some really very specific industry specific ones like there's DOD, like there's Alcia West is a um, kind of a big Navy show. There's DOTAS, which is a big DOD IT show. Um, so the, the defense space has its um, shows. Civilian has a lot of different shows, but they're still, I think you, did you ever come to AWS public sector? Um, personally, personally, I've not been there. No, I, I, I know I was invited, but I, I couldn't make it. But yeah, okay. okay that makes yeah, sense. that's another one. Um, that's uh, again, it's one of the AWS. You know, they have you know every year they have a lot of summits across the country. Uh, this is just one DC area, but it's really focused on public sector. So that's a, a real big show um, um, in the in the public sector space. But yeah, generally you don't hear about these outside of the the government. The mm -hmm. outside the beltway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Willie, what else? Is there anything else that we need to learn from you before we, we close out this episode? Anything that you either wish the world would know about the government sector? I mean, our, like the IT world, the uh, observability world. Or is there anything where you said, man, I wish that the government folks would listen more and do this more what I see outside of government. So I think we, well, first of all, I, I want to just take a minute and thank you both for inviting me. This has been uh, super, super informative, and I always enjoy talking to you guys. So that's just been been great. Uh, as for, you know, what I'd like to share, you know, I think if I could leave one thing, um, you know, I think I mentioned I've been with Donna Trace now a little bit, right, right around 13 years now. Um, most of that time has been in the federal space. Um, I've enjoyed every minute of working with the public sector. Um, I enjoy every minute working with the federal government. I think today in today's political climate, you know, people just think about the dysfunction. They just hear about like, you know, all the things that are going on and, and just all the craziness that's going on around the world. Um, I just want people to, to remember that, you know, yes, there is craziness. There is there is some dysfunction. But all of that politics aside, there are a lot of really dedicated, um, patriotic, you know, public sector um, employees, contractors and gov gov or government employees that are, you know, dedicated daily. Um, using observability and other tools and other, you know, um, mission tools and so forth to keep our country safe, to keep it, you know, running, to keep even with all the craziness, keeping things and the lights on. And I just want to make sure that, you know, people don't lose sight that there are real people out there. You know, there's a lot of um, a, a, a lot of just nastiness and just, you know, politics going on. But at the end of the day, there are real people who are doing really important jobs. And that's just not in the U.S. That's in every country out there. That's in, you know, in Austria. That's in, you know, in France, that's in Australia. We've got, I've got colleagues who are working in all of these countries. We've got colleagues in Israel and places that are seeing a lot of strife and a lot of, of just, I can't describe the pain, mm -hmm. but, you know, there are people still trying to keep the lights on who are still trying to keep their countries working. And I just want to give my utmost respect to them because um, I don't, I, I mean, I might work um, for the public sector, um, in the commercial space, but there are people who dedicate their lives to this, to their government. So I, I just want to give my respect to them. Awesome. You know, I, yeah, I agree with all that. Um, it's definitely not a, as you said, with the pay scale idea, people aren't going into this um, because of the glory, right? Mm -hmm. They're going into it because they want to contribute something. Um, and I want to thank you a ton for being on. I, I just want to share my one hope and dream for the government. So this happened when I read um, Phoenix Project. Mm -hmm. Right now, I know this isn't going to happen because there's policy. There's everything about the way politics can happen, right? But when I read the Phoenix Project and I read about you know the the, the DevOps and the, and the iterative changes, the let's get it out, let's find what's working, not working. I was like, man, imagine if government policy could work like that. You know, and, and we're seeing part of that, right? You know, we're seeing the IT section being able to embrace these things, right? If there's just some way for it to shift over to policy. I always look at like the Affordable Health Care as, Act mm -hmm. as an example where it's like, yeah, it wasn't necessarily the greatest bill when it started. But if mm -hmm. we could have a process where we put that out there 
and then quickly find what's working, what's not working, full DevOps style, and tweak and adjust and tweak and adjust, you can get these things to be really good. Obviously, there's politics, there's things that are, okay, if it's law, it's got to be voted on and all, but it'd be so awesome to see in some fantasy world of mine, the DevOps and Agile push from the, uh, you know, the public sector IT stuff, shifting into policy control and all that stuff, which would just be a win for everybody. But Agile politics, that would be yeah. interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it'd be awesome. But uh, in the meantime, thank you. you know, again, it's, it's great to see um, what's going on there. It, it's great to know that there are a lot of uh, awesome advancements being made in, in the public sector. It's not just this, you know, bureaucratic boondoggle people might think, oh, I want to change this line of code. We've got to get 10 approvals. Like, that's not happening. That's not the case. Um, but yeah, Andy, any, any, any final words from you there? No, I took a lot of notes. And I also want to highlight, we will add the links to your podcast, the Tech Transformers, also yep. into the description, because I think there's a lot of great content there. It's also how I got to know about it, because I found and I listened to uh, one or two of the episodes, and then I reached out to Carolyn, and then ended up with you and uh, in a good way, not ended up with you. <laughs> <laughs> just just like my wife said. I'm just you're, kidding. I'm getting my wife to not say that. <laughs> <laughs> Willie, <laughs> you <might listen> to <laughs> <laughs> Willie, you're good enough for government. Exactly. <laughs> no, but I, you know, thank, thanks a lot. And uh, folks listen to their podcast. And um, yeah, that's it. I, I hope it will not take another four to six years or however long it has really been. Nope. To see you again, I'm sure we'll see each other hopefully sooner. And, We're going to uh, make that happen. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Awesome having you. Awesome. I think this might be is this the first time we talked about government stuff. Uh, yep. Andy. Yeah. Hopefully, won't, I believe so. Yeah. Hopefully, it won't be the last. We, I, if yeah. something big happens, maybe you can have me back on. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, all right. And thank you. Thank you for our listeners. We hope uh, we f- hope you found this topic interesting. Uh, interesting to us as always. And uh, we always get to learn amazing things from our guests. So thank you, Willie. Uh, And we'll see everybody next time. Bye-bye. Bye.